I've come to the place where at, toward the close of the year here, I'm, I'm emphasizing that restoration is not only being restored from sinful practices or, or terrible uh, life-controlling habits, but we, experiencing, we experience restoration when we move into the new life, the purpose of God in our lives, and we stay committed to that. You know, I, I have learned it's easy to start, but you've got to have a different kind of faith to finish. Right? I know a lot of people who start, but they don't finish. I know a lot of people who began this Christian race, but for some reason they ran out of gas, they hit the wall, they turned aside, and, and they gave up for some reason because it takes, a, it takes a different kind of faith to start and to finish. Amen? And so, uh, as we talk about experiencing restoration... I want to talk about uh, staying committed for a while. In other words, we experiencing, experience restoration when we learn how to stay the course through the circumstances and the situations in our life. I want to begin by reading Proverbs 4.23 and, and I want to set, set this as a kind of a foundation so that we can move on to our my, my text. Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. My idea this morning is there is a difference between the circumstances of our life and the issues in our life. I look at this kind of as the circumstances are the external things that we deal with, the, the troubles, the trials, the, you know, the, the, the changes that are unexpected that we face. But the issues are the internal things uh, that we deal with, the things of the heart. Um, and, and, the, and I have come to understand that you can't separate the internal things of the issues of the heart from the circumstances or the response to the circumstances in your life. The issues in your heart will cause you to respond to circumstances in the right way or the wrong way. And Proverbs says, keep your heart, for out of your heart spring the issues of life. Now, I believe that these issues that, that are spoken of in the Scriptures... Um, that we can have issues with people around us. You know, we can have issues with our neighbors, our, our friends, our, our employers, our employees, um, our husband and our wife. We can have, even have issues with our children, can't we? Um, and we can have issues with God because we don't understand why God allowed something to happen to us. Or, sometimes we can have an issue with God because we don't understand why He allowed it to happen to somebody we care about or someone we love. We can have issues with ourselves. Because, you know, I, I, I make the statement, we all got issues as we live this life. And we don't always understand why God allowed something to happen to us. Sometimes we don't understand why we failed. Sometimes we don't understand why we gave up or gave in. Sometimes those are issues of the heart. And we look back on our life and we say, man, if I would have just... I know a businessman who say to me, man, if I would have just made that investment at the right time, or if I would have just sold that business at the right time, and, and so, we, we even have issues with ourselves. And the word issue in the Scripture literally means the borders and the parameters of our life. And, and the borders and the parameters are not set because of the circumstances. They are set by the issues in our heart in how we respond to the circumstances 
in our life. The Apostle Paul went through some tough circumstances in, our, in his life. Uh, he was persecuted by the Romans and by the Jews. He, he suffered imprisonment, physical beatings. He, he was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He suffered hunger and loss of many things. And he also had personal issues. And I, this is the text I want us to look at. Paul learned how to overcome the, the external circumstances of his life. He learned how to put them in the proper perspective so that they didn't derail him from doing what God wanted him to do. They didn't change his purpose in life. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning verse 5, let's read that together. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5. And well, I want you to read this with me real nice and loud so, so that we can, we can hear it and that it will touch our hearts. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so let's read it together. Ready? For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Paul said that they were tired and they were scared. And, and when he came to the uh, Macedonia, to the Christians, uh, you know the thing about this Corinthian church was they were an un uncommitted group of people. I mean, Paul had started this church, had loved these people, had, he, he, he went out of his way and, and he suffered great physical uh, harm and loss to establish this church. And now, he comes to this church and, and they had allowed a group of false teachers to turn them against Paul and, and turn them against the the true gospel of Jesus Christ that they were saved by. They were carnal. And they were living by the standards and the practices of their past rather than living the new life that Jesus came to give them. And so Paul, he wrote this letter to them. As a matter of fact, we, we break it up into two letters. And, and Paul wrote this letter to them and he addressed very specifically some of the problems and some of the needs in their life and in their church. He, he, they, were, they were living uh, in a way that, that brought about a reproach or a bad name on the church and on the message of Jesus through their lifestyle. Do you know that you can live in such a way that it brings a bad name on the church. Did you know that? That wasn't much of an amen, but I'll take it. Amen. And, and, and then in 2 Corinthians 7, 8, Paul said, For even if I had made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle that made you sorry though only for a while. In other words, Paul said, I wrote you that letter and I knew you wouldn't like it. I wrote you that letter and I spoke the truth into your life and you got mad at me over it. You were sorry about it, he said. And he said, I knew when I wrote it, you wouldn't like it. I knew that it would rub you the wrong way, that it would bristle your back like a cat that's getting ready to fight. You ever see a cat that bristles its back, ready to fight, you know? And cats. But, but he said, he said, I wrote that letter to you and I specifically pointed out those areas and those behaviors in your life that were not Christ-like, but he's, notice what he said. He said, it made you sorry only for a little while. Now, 
It's like when somebody says to you, you know what? You shouldn't have said that. You were wrong. And you need to go apologize. You ever have anybody do that to you? I've had that happen a few times, haven't I, Sheila? You know, you ever have somebody say to me, you know what? What you did was terrible. You need to go apologize. You need to, you need to make that right. And you're mad about it. You don't want to hear it. You stomp off. And you're mad. And then you get over here and you start thinking about it. And you think, you know what? I know they're right. I should apologize. I should go back. I should make that right. I should correct that. See, the Bible, Message Bible says it this way. Uh, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 7, verses, beginning verse 8, Listen to the way the Message Bible reads it. And I don't use Message too much, but I think it's really uh, beautiful the way the Message Bible uh, discusses this. It said, I know I distressed you greatly with my letter, although I felt awful at the time. I don't feel at all bad now that I see how it turned out. The letter upset you, but only for a while. Now I am glad not that you were upset, but that you were jarred into turning things around. You let the distress drive you to God, not from Him. The result was all gain, no loss. Distress that drives us to God does that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We never regret that kind of pain. But those that let distress drive them away from God are full of regrets end up on a deathbed of regrets. And now, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? You are more alive, more concerned, you're more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. Looked at from any angle, you've come out of this with purity in your heart. Paul was saying that I have learned that in my life, there are certain situations and there are certain circumstances. There are issues that I deal with in my heart, but they are only for a while. And I know that God is going to take it and turn it around and help me understand it and make me better for it. I think we need to ask ourselves this morning, what are the issues in your heart? Or the circumstances in your life that you're dealing with. How do you respond to those? You know, how, how will you react to the situations that you find yourself in? Or the fears, the, the worries, the anxieties, the, the attitudes, the anger in your heart? See, Paul learned how to stay committed in times of trouble and deal with the issues in his heart. Let me say this morning, if you're a Christian, you're going to deal with circumstances and you're going to deal with the issues in your heart. Because the closer you get to the Lord, the more the issues in your heart are going to be seen not only by you, but by those around you especially in the ministry. In the ministry, I, I don't always encourage people to be in the ministry. I don't. Not, not just, you know, because I, I don't, it's not that people are not qualified. It's I know that when you get into the ministry, what's in your heart is going to be exposed. Whether you like it or not, you can try to hide it. You can try to, you, you know, you can try to take uh, uh, your old way of, of, you know, covering things up and looking good when things aren't good. You know how we do that, right? Look at your neighbor and say, you know how that works. You try to make yourself to be something you're not, right? And when you do that, when you are in the ministry, people figure you out really quick. And that's not always a pleasant situation to be in. And when you're in the ministry, 
You know, you, you, who you are comes out. Your fears. Because I've learned I had a whole lot more fear than I thought I did. I was dedicated to the Lord. I, I, I did my best to, to be a good Christian and be a blessing, you know, to, to people and to the church and to my family. But I, I came to realize that when, when you get put into certain situations, you fear things that you don't think you fear, like people. I've come to a new appreciation for Elijah running down that mountain because he was afraid of Jezebel. I know people say, how could a prophet of God, you know, be afraid of a Jezebel? I'm telling you. I met a few women in my day that make my hand shake a little bit too. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not dissing on the women. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, people can make you afraid. They can draw out your fears. They can play on your anxieties and your worries and your fears. You know, you have to be careful uh, when, you, when you come to understand that's why Paul said in verse 5, when we came to Macedonia, he said our bodies had no rest and, and we were troubled. Outside were conflicts and inside were fears. But in verse 6 he says, but nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. See, the question is, in our times of trouble and in our times of circumstance and, and when we come to face the issues in our own heart, how do we overcome those things for a while? We have to have a for a while mentality. We have to come to a place in our lives to where we understand that no matter what we face, no matter what is in our heart or lacking in our heart, God somehow will take that thing and give us the victory after a while. After a while, God will see us through. Because Philippians 1 said that the Lord Jesus who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. In other words, God is going to finish His work after a while in your life. And so you've got to adopt an after a while mindset. You, if you're gonna, if you're gonna fulfill God's purpose, you've got to look at your life and say, "Okay, things might be bad. My knees might be knocking, and I'm afraid. I got an issue that I don't know how to overcome." But after a while, God is going to see me through. After a while, God's going to give me the victory. Amen. After a while, and so how do we stay connected and committed through the circumstances? And through the issues. And I think Paul shows us here. First of all, he said, you have to run to God, not away from Him. Verse 6 says, nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforts us, he said. In other words, we will always go somewhere in time of trouble. We'll always seek refuge with somebody. Some people, in time of trouble, they go to the bottle. Some people take a pill. Some people run to, to people who don't, won't help them overcome. They will only affirm their problem and say, you're all right, I have the same need. You're all right, I got the same problem. You're going to be all right. You see... We need to be careful who we run to in times of distress. We need to go to God. And I think we need to learn to go to God in every situation first, not last. If we would be more diligent to pray when there's a problem, I believe we'd see much more victory in our life. If we, would be, if we would first look to God in our time of trouble and call upon Him and ask Him to help us, even in our fears, if we would ask God to help us rather than try to work it out on our own or cover it up or make ourselves out to be somebody we're not, we have the victory much more quickly than we do. See, Paul said in Hebrews 1 verse 1, 
God who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers through the prophets has in these last days spoken to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. I believe that God will speak to us today. I believe that the Bible is the greatest resource to bring victory and overcoming the needs in our life. It's God. It's God you can go to no matter what you face. It's God you can go to no matter how afraid you are. It's God you can go to no matter what your need is. Go to God. Don't look to man. Look to God. Counselors don't have the, the, you know, self-help gurus. I'm, I'm not against anybody that can help us. But I have learned that there are certain situations in my life only God can help me with. Only God will understand. Only God can give me the victory. Only God can fill that loneliness. Only God can fill the void. Only God can deliver me. In, the, in my mind and in my heart. You know... Only God. And God will speak to us in time of distress. He'll give you the comfort you need if you'll pray and ask Him. The problem is we run to everything else. We look to all other kind of sources. We look to all, uh, all different kinds of uh, you know, uh, self-help things. But God will help you. See, back in the old days when there was a problem... The church came together and prayed. I remember one time that our next door neighbor, we, we lived out in the country on the border of Indiana and Ohio, and, and we lived out in the country, and there was a man that just lived right down the street from us, and he had a, had a big barn. It was like a, he had a farm, and, and in, this, in his uh, barn he had like a store, and he, like a small, like a convenience store. Well, he didn't have a gas station attached to it. And, and the neighbors would come and buy products and food from him, and, and it helped him, you know, keep his family uh, fed and, and provided for. And I remember one day that barn caught on fire. And that, bur that, that barn burned totally to the ground. I mean, there was no way, you know, we didn't have a fire department just down the street. By the time the fire department got there, it was burned to the ground. And I remember, as a little boy, I was about four years old. And I still remember, as all the neighbors gathered around there, most of us went to the same church. We went to a little church. We were a, a Pentecostal church. And we met in the Masonic Lodge Hall. That's where we met. It was just a square building, but they allowed us to use it. You know, the Mason used it on on the weekend, on Friday and Saturday, and then we used it on Sundays and Wednesdays. I remember the old wooden floor in that old Masonic Lodge Hall. And those women would come and they'd wear those buns on their head and long dresses, and they'd wear those shoes that had like a wooden, you know, like a wooden heel. And man, when they would get to dancing, I mean, that whole building would make a rattle. The windows would rattle when they got to shout. The men would wear bibbed overalls because they were all farmers. And they wore starched flannel shirts. That's what they wore. And, uh, and I remember uh, there was another fire in the community there and there was a family that had six children. One winter and and they had a fire and two of those children died in the fire. They couldn't get them out. And I remember in both of those situations that people, they went to the church and they started to pray. And they joined together, joined their hands, and they would lay their hands on those families that were so affected and they would pray over them and they would cry out to God that God would give them comfort and give them peace and give them the ability to go through this for a while. That God would enable them to overcome. And that God would comfort them as only He could. When you lose two children, 
I mean, your friends and neighbors are good. It's nice to hear them stand with you, but they can't give you the comfort that God can give you when you lose children. And so, we need to go to God, run to Him. Secondly, the, the Apostle Paul said, we run to God relationships. In other words, those people that God has placed in our life. In verse 6b, he said, we were comforted by the coming of Titus. See, when you're facing external and internal issues, you need to be able to talk to people who will help you follow God's plan, not somebody else's plan. Stay away from people who take you from God's will. Join forces in times of trouble with people who are pursuing God, who are dedicated to God, who are living for God. Don't join forces with people who are going to take you away from God's will. Don't, don't listen to the counsel when you're going through the fire of somebody who says, I know how you feel, they did that to me. Worst thing you can do. I, I've been around preachers. You know, groups of preachers. And I'm careful about who I hang out with nowadays. Because when you get around them, you know, they've been hurt, they've been wounded, they got issues, you know. We all got issues, right? Even preachers. Somebody needs to say amen right there. And they, you know, they, they're in it only for the money. They're holding people at arm's length. You know, they've been offended and so I'm not going to be offended again. they got issues. And you don't need to be around those kinds of people. You need to be around people who are pursuing God's will. People that are seeking God in their life. I mean, think about this. Who are the God people in your life right now? It's good to know who your friends are. But you need God friends in your life. You know, I test people. What I do is, I, I, I don't want to miss a God friend making a new God friend. You know, I mean, I don't want to miss somebody that God brings into my life that can speak, in, you know, blessing over me. But, but when I meet new people, I... I, I'm a little, you know, I try to see if they're going where I'm going. If they're on the same page that I'm on. And if they're not, I don't hate them. And I don't love them. Maybe they're having a bad day. But I don't let take their counsel. I don't want them speaking into my life. I want people that are pursuing God's will. That are dedicated fully to God. And, and, let, and they, they've been where I've been. They've been through what I've been through. They were there for a while, and they can give me testimony that God's going to bring me through it, and that I'm not going to stay there, that I'm going to have the victory eventually over it. It's God, people, that you'll find the most support from. That's the thing I found out about the church. When I grew up in that church, I... And in the church, the Pentecostal... And here's the thing, you know. I grew up in the old-fashioned Pentecostal church where there was a lot of rules. Like a lot of rules. Like rules about everything. Like rules about what kind of pants you can wear and how you, you know, cut your hair and the makeup. And, and that's the kind of church I grew up in. Anybody identify with that? Grew up in a church with a lot of rules. And, uh, and, uh, and the thing I found was uh, those rules, I think they were good for me for a while. I think I needed rules. And, and I had my best friend that we grew up through school together and he was in one of those churches and I was in another one. And when he got out of high school... He said, I'll see you to the church and I ain't coming back because I don't want the rules. And I think the church he went to maybe it was a little worse than mine, maybe. But, but the thing I remember about the church was when I was a little boy, now think about this. I went to a church full, you know, with farmers. 
And these farmers all carried a knife in their pocket. They all had knives. Farmers carry knives, right? And there was one man, <laughs> I was a little kid, and, he, and every time I saw him, he'd say, come here, boy, I want to cut your ear off. Can you imagine saying that to a kid today in the church? Man, as soon as I saw him, I'd run the other way. I wouldn't get anywhere close to this guy. But when we got into church, I, I kind of felt like I was safe. He wouldn't go cut my ear off, you know. But every time he'd see me, he'd say, come here, boy. He knew it'd scare me. I want to cut your ear off. He'd put his hand in his pocket like he's going to get his knife out. And you know, I think back on that and I think to myself, you know, with all those rules, and a lot of times, you know, with people in the church that didn't always say the right thing, what caused me to stay? And what caused my friend to leave? And I, I, I understand that when I was in that church, those men who had the bibbed overalls and the starch flannel shirts, they laid their hands on me and they said, Boy... God's going to use a boy like you. God's going to take a boy like you and He's going to cause you to do good things for the Lord. You're going to be a blessing one of these days. That's, and, and so it was the love and the affirmation of the church that kept me coming back. It was, it was, the, it was, the, it was not only the rules, although the rules were important. I think I needed the rules. I'm glad I had rules. We all need rules. We've done away with the rules nowadays and that's a problem. We need parameters. We need guidelines. But we also need to understand that God has a purpose and a plan for our lives because not everybody who preaches the rules lives by the rules. We all got issues. We all got weaknesses, don't we? And so... Paul was troubled when he came to Macedonia and the Christians were upset with him. They were mad at him. But it was only for a while. And some of our relationships are hindered because we can't look beyond the surface to the intent of the heart of the person that's speaking to us. I've had people speak truth into my life and it made me mad. But when I went away, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you know He's right. You know, what He's saying to you is true. Or the Holy Spirit would say to me, you know what, they mean right. They mean to be a blessing to you, not a curse to you. There are people that hold on to hurts and offenses and they can't move beyond them. And if you're going to do God's will in your life, you've got to have a new mindset that puts everything in perspective, even your own issues, and know that it's only for a while. And then lastly, I believe Paul ran to the church family. He, there's no better place to overcome the issues in your heart than the church. This is my experience. If you have things you're trying to overcome, don't go to the world. They don't have an answer for you. They'll have you an excuse. The world will give you an excuse, not an answer. And the church family's not perfect, and sometimes we can disagree, but God puts us in the church to help us become what God wants us to become. So today, my idea is we have to adopt this for a while mindset. It says, yeah, I don't like what you said to me or I don't like what I'm dealing with in my heart, but it's only for a while. God's going to see us through. God's going to give us the victory. He's given us promises in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. He's given us an open heart, the Bible says, in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 3, we need a loyal heart. Because a loyal heart will never be put into bondage. Let me say this, and I'm closed. Daniel, if you'd come. Loyalty will never put you in bondage. Being loyal is what God wants us to be. 
even in circumstances, even in relationships that are not always the best and not always perfect. A loyal heart is committed to work through the problems and understand the power of loyalty. Loyalty is more for you than for somebody else. A loyal heart is offended only for a while. And then it overcomes. And 2 Corinthians 7, 12 says we need a teachable heart. That we would be able to be taught the right thing. Paul spoke to the Corinthians in a direct manner about specific lifestyle choices they made. But he wrote it anyway. Because he knew that God would speak to them after a while. Teachable heart can disagree, but still love the other person that you disagree with. So this morning, as we close, I want us to think about our lives and think about fulfilling God's purpose. And we have to come to the place to where we say, okay, I know there are things I'm facing, but they're only for a while. They'll pass. David said, this too shall pass when his son with Bathsheba died. The Bible says that he got up from sackcloth and ashes and fasting. And he said, he washed his face and said, let's go have dinner. Because he knew he came to a place to where the grieving was over with. And so, God wants us to adopt that same mindset that says it's only for a while. I'm afraid, but I'm not going to be afraid forever. I'm a victim, but I'm not going to be a victim forever. I've been hurt, but I'm not going to be hurt forever. God doesn't tell us not to question. God can take our questions. God can take you asking Him why. He's not offended by that. And He will lead you to the place to where you understand that these things took place for a while. And God had something in mind through it all. And so this morning, I want you to stand with me and we're going to pray. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to touch us and help us to stay committed for a while. We don't need to be dependent on people forever. But there are times that God brings people into our life that encourage us for a while, that lift us up for a while, that pray for us for a while, that, 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 that read us scriptures for a while, that sit down and cry with us for a while. After a while, the Bible says, Paul knew that the Corinthians would be blessed. And he said, you're better now because of it. It's caused you to be more compassionate. It's caused you to be more dedicated. It's caused you to be more understanding. Not only of God, but of the people in your life and even yourself. Paul understood that his fears were for a while. And God delivered him and gave him the victory. I know I'm speaking to somebody here today. I know that. The Holy Spirit just confirmed that in my heart while I was preparing for this the last few days. There's somebody here today that needs to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to commit myself because I know after a while I'm going to have the victory. I'm in the middle of the battle. I'm facing a circumstance I don't understand. But God's going to see me through it. Amen? And so this morning I want to pray. Maybe you're here today and you felt like giving up. You felt like turning back. You've questioned why God allowed this to happen or that to happen or why it turned out like it did. Nothing wrong with those questions. But God wants to help you understand it's only for a while. And then you're going to have the victory. So I want to pray today. Maybe that's you. Maybe you today need to have a fresh revelation of God's plan and God's work in your life. 
If that's you, we want to pray together. If you have those questions, I want you to come and stand at the front. We're going to pray together. I've had them. I've dealt with them. I still work through them. Why? Why did this person say that? Why did this person do that? Why am I so afraid? Why, God, did you choose me knowing all of my weaknesses and all my failures? But it's only for a while. God makes us what we are not so that we can fulfill His purpose. And He makes us who He wants us to be. Amen? I'm not the same person I used to be. I'm not up here all about me, but I'm, I'm a living witness. I'm not the same person I used to be. God is changing me. From glory to glory, I believe. From victory to victory. From faith to faith. God is working something in my life even through my adversity. Amen? And so, if you want us to join with you in prayer, just come and stand at the front. We're going to agree together. We're going to believe that God is going to meet every need. Can I have my prayer folks up here with us? And we're just going to pray. And we're going to believe that God is going to meet every need. That God is going to touch your life. Amen? For a while. Look at your neighbor and say, it's only for a while. It's only for a while. And God's going to give you the victory. So if you would, take somebody by the hand. And let's pray for them. Let's lift one another up today and encourage one another to have faith to believe it's only